spoopy season is here, and with that in mind, I need to know if I can beat a Pokemon X Hardcore Nuzlocke using only spoopy types. And if you're unfamiliar with the rules of a Hardcore Nuzlocke, they'll be on screen right now and down in the description below. As for the Pokemon we can use in this run, Kalos has a selection of 11 possible ghost encounters. However, Rotom and Litwick are both in the Lost Hotel, so we'll have to make a choice when the time comes. Additionally, Pumpkaboo and Phantup are both on Route 16, so we'll get what we get, and that rounds things down to 9 total Pokemon. But... And it's a pretty big but, I've decided to also ban Shedinja. Shedinja has the ability Wonder Guard, which lets it only get hit by super effective moves, and since we know the movesets of every trainer's Pokemon in this game, that means we can play around every single Pokemon that doesn't have one of these types in its moveset. And so to make things just a little bit more difficult, I've also straight up banned Shedinja. Now 8 encounters isn't exactly a lot to work with, but with all the introductions out of the way, let's do this. Pokemon X and Y start out with the player meeting up with their best friends to receive a Pokemon. And they will call me Count Dracula on this special occasion. You want us to call you Count Dracula? Now you listen here, did you hear me stutter even once, bitch? Anyway, this is the part of the game where we have to pick our first Pokemon, but we actually can't get a ghost type until after the first gym. So what I did is I replaced Fennekin with Hone Edge, which means Serena is going to have a super effective dark type against our ghost types. Then later at Route 6, where we can actually find Hone Edge, we're going to replace this one, but for now, this will be our proxy blade. And it ends up having an attack boosting naughty nature, which is super awesome. But now that we have our first Pokemon in hand, it's time we face our first challenge against Shauna who chose Chespin. And I gotta say, much like the love dynamic between these two characters, this battle was very one-sided. You see, Honage comes with both Sword Stance and Fury Cutter, which happens to be super effective against Chespin, so easy. What are you all gonna do? Well, let me tell you all about it, Shauna. You see, we're about to challenge every single gym in Kalos, starting off with Viola and her bug types. And this might seem easy since Honage is a steel type, but it's not quite as easy as you might think. As we're setting up our sword stances, Surskit foolishly goes for water sport, thinking that we're going to use fire moves, but it's also doing massive damage with bubble. And before we can take it out with one plus six tackle, it actually ends up getting us to three HP, so this isn't looking good. And the first turn, Vivillon goes for Harden, but then it goes for Infestation, which leaves us at one HP. So we're going to go down if we can't take this thing. Oh, we got a high roll. I guess that works for me. First badge down. Our next destination is Lumio City, where we meet up with the most handsome of Pokemon professors. And of course Lysander. I can't stand the thought of the world becoming uglier. Listen, homie, that type of existential thing is not something you bring up with an aging woman. It's poor form. But now that we have all that Lumios nonsense behind us, we can finally get to Route 6 where we can find our first real encounter, the real Hone Edge. I capture it and name it Skeleton, and this time it has a minus speed nature, so a lot crummier than the first Hone Edge we had. We then have to pay a thousand dollars just to enter Parfum Palace. The proceeds from the entrance fee help pay for repairing and restoring the palace. Yeah, probably. Wait, excuse me, what? Then we have to go through the tedious process of hunting down this guy's dog, after which we celebrate because the worst part of the game is finally over. Moving on to Route 8, we can finally get our next encounter, a Drifloon. I name it Witch, and it has a pretty bad minus special attack nature, but that Unburden ability could really come in handy. Very shortly after that, I was looking for a next encounter as I fight this lady who has an Azumarill, and my Honage was already asleep from fighting her first two Pokemon. She fires off a rain-boosted bubble beam that leaves me at 1 HP, and she then just goes for a defense curl and throws, so I guess we get to keep Drifloon. But we can actually access Route 10 before the second gym, so we can find our next encounter, a Golette. I catch it and name it Zombie, and not only does it have the epic Iron Fist ability, but also holds the Light Clay item. Now hear me out for a second. Grant has a Tyrant with a Strong Jaw ability that also knows Bite. This pretty obviously spells Disaster and Doom for our Ghost type, so I had to do what I had to do, and in my calculations, it said that I had to have close to max attack on my Hone Edge. So after a bit of super training, I managed to get Hone Edge to max attack, but this Amora still has Thunder Waves, so it's not guaranteed that we even win this fight. Now Grant starts out with his Amora, and since it has Refrigerate Takedown, we can't exactly use either Golet or Drifloon. This means that everything is entirely up to Hone Edge, who's gonna have to set up the plus six and unfortunately get paralyzed by Amora. At this point in the game, we can only get Orn Berries, so we won't be able to heal this paralysis off at all with Cherry Berries. And now that we've managed to get to plus six, it's all about hitting two of these Shadow Sneaks. Plus five wouldn't do the job against this Tyrant, so can we do it? Will we get fully paralyzed? Fortunately, the RNG gods bless us, and we don't get that 30% paralysis chance, which means that we beat the second gym, and I'm feeling optimistic. 
We then have our first run in with Team Flare, and oh my goodness, Lysander, are you trying to get every single youth in Kalos to be bullied? Either way, the next obstacle in our way is Karina, and not the gym fight against Karina, just this weird double Lucario fight. But the silly thing about this fight is that she can only use Power Up Punch and Faint on both of her Lucarios, none of which can hit any of her ghost types. So this fight that's usually pretty scary, we can just sweep through freely, no problem at all. This means our next destination is Reflection Cave, where before I realized that you can actually run away from Shadow Tag with ghost types, I knock out all the Wobbuffets, and this means that Drifloon actually evolves into Driftlim. Here we can also find our next encounter, a Sableye, that I capture and name Trick or Treat. It has a pretty bad timid nature and keen eye, which I don't know what we're gonna do with. And I feel it's also worth mentioning that Reflection Cave is one of the biggest difficulty spikes in all of X and Y, so avoid as many trainers as you can. That's what I did. Finally, we arrive in Shalor City. Here we find Mr. Bonding standing in the corner of a Pokemon Center, and Mr. Bonding you are a strange fella. That's all I'm gonna say this time. You've been warned. We can also find this guy that gives us the Eviolite. I was invited out the other day by a friend who recently joined up with Team Flare. He kept going on about how only Team Flare had a future to look forward to. A <laughs> future of poor fashion choices, maybe. Yo, look at Mr. Mega over here. Eyebrows on fleek. Now, before we can actually challenge the gym here, we have to have our first battle against Serena, but it goes pretty easily since we can just set up three swords dances. Then all we have to do is hit some Shadow Sneaks, Aerial Aces, and Shadow Sneaks again, and we're good. So with that pathetic display of battle from Serena, we have Karina to fight up next, and she's got a gym full of fighting types. Now, if you haven't heard, fighting types can't actually hit ghost types at all, and this Machoke does have Rock Tomb, but for whatever reason, it just kept going for Leer, so after a few Hone Claws, I decided to let our newly acquired Sableye do a bit of work and take out this Machoke in two hits with Shadow Sneak. Could it have hit me with Rock Tomb? many time? Yep. Was it a risky strategy? Sure. Do I have regrets? Not really. But next up is Miemfu, and this thing doesn't actually have a single move that can hit ghost types, so I can freely set up three stockpiles and a focus energy. Then two critical hit hexes later, and it's down for the count, and we only have to contend with Halucha, which goes for Hone Claws as I just take it out with a bunch of moves. I mean, we kind of had that one from the start. So do you know the Mega Evolution Guru's real name? It's Gherkin. <laughs> Sup, Gherkin. We then get access to Mega Evolution, which I'm only ever going to allow for the champion. We go ahead and pick up some leftovers, and then it's time to fight good old Serena again. But her team isn't actually good enough to do anything yet, so we're going to skip that fight for now. And this means that we have to go up against the next gym leader, Ramos, and I keep saying that Ramos is the least interesting gym leader. He's so forgettable. But then I scroll down to the comments, and you guys are there like, we love Ramos. Sit on me, Ramos. Almost. Stop it. Get some help. Anyway, we take out the jump bluff with a couple of aerial aces from Hone Edge, then Go Goat comes out, so we swap in Witch, and Drift Blim quad resists every single move that this Go Goat has, so we can freely just set up the focus energy and take it out with a few gusts. I then realize that Hone Edge is the perfect counter to this Weepin' Bell, which basically can't touch us, and I take it out in one aerial ace. Ramos, uh, you're very forgettable. But you know what isn't forgettable? Hone Edge evolving into an awesome Dublade. Sword Pokemon good, key Pokemon bad. We then have to deal with a little bit of Team Flare nonsense, but it's not quite peak nonsense, so we'll get into that later. Finally back in Lumio City, where I just can't get these controls to work. Just trying to get a cab. Can I just... Oh, oh hey, buddy. Uh, could you take me where I'm going? Uh, 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 okay, yeah, there we go. I'm so fashionable. And so with my wardrobe updated, it's time to update my badge case and take on the fifth gym leader, Clemont, and his electric types. Clemont starts out with a Molga, and expecting him to go for Volt Switch, I decide to stay in and go for Knock Off just to get rid of the Sturdy on Magneton. I then successfully predict a Thunderbolt so I can safely get Zombie in, and as he sets up his electric terrain, I go for a Rock Polish, so the next turn I take him out with a Magnitude 7. Now as for his next Pokemon, Heliolisk, it does only go down to a high level Magnitude, but luckily I roll a 9, so I take it out in one hit, and we only have to deal with this Amolga. And the Amolga ends up being a huge nuisance. It doesn't do that much damage, but I get it down twice to like 1 HP as Clement goes for a Hyper Potion, and it gets me low enough so that I have to swap out into Skeleton. But with the combination of Eevee Light and Skeleton's massive defenses, a couple of Night Slashes is all it takes to take out this Amolga, and we claim our 5th Gym Badge. Which means we can move on to Route 14, where we once again have to fight Serena and once again defeat her mercilessly. Why is she so easy to defeat? She deserves so much better. 
Um, anyway, we can get our next encounter here, a haunter that I catch a name Boo. And if we talk to this girl in LaBear City, she actually gives us the Gengarite. And I know what you're thinking, hey, you can't get Gengar in single player, but I use the universal Pokemon randomizer, which means that when Haunter gets to level 37, well, it evolves into Gengar, as you're seeing right now. But like I said, I'm not gonna allow Mega Evolution for anything but the champion fight. And with all that done, it's time to face our next opponent, Valerie, and oh my goodness, what does this girl look like? Anyway, she starts out the battle with a Mawile, so I start with Trick or Treat, and I miss a Will-O-Wisp right off the bat, so I have to waste another turn going for it, and it goes for an Iron Defense. The following turn, I swap out into Zombie, who can now tank a crunch very well because of both Eevee Light and that burn. This means that I can tank a whole bunch more of those hits, and I fire off a bunch of magnitudes until that Mawile is eventually gone. I do end up getting pretty low, however, so I swap out into Skeleton as Mr. Mime comes out and hit us with a not very powerful Psychic as it then sets up the Reflect and the Light Screen. Fortunately, a few Swords Dances and a Shadow Sneak does the trick, but then comes Sylveon, so I swap out into Gengar. And Gengar resists this thing very well, and we can put a burn on it just to get a bit of residual damage. I also decide to go for Confuse Ray, but it never ends up hitting itself in Confusion at all since it snaps out pretty much right away. I then hit it with a Shadow Sneak from Skeleton, which takes it down fairly low, after which I get Cute Charmed, and then I go down to 5 HP as I swap out into Drift Blim, and the next turn, it goes down to my Thunderbolt. No kid, yeah, stay away from me, Valerie. Now, while we're saving the factory from Team Flare, Zombie gets to level 43, which means it evolves into a powerful Golurk. We then find out that Team Flare are here, and they're upset that we're intruding. Like, take a look in the mirror, Team Flare. What do you think you're doing? So we swiftly kick their butts, and their names are Soloja and Bryony? What kind of names are these? Do I get a fake name if I join Team Flare? Because I'd like mine to be... Also, Serena, why are you apologizing for what Team Flare did? You really are too good for this world. Moving on, though, we now get access to the Lost Hotel. And aside from the fact that it sounds like a low-budget TV show from the 90s, this is actually where we can find our next encounter, Rotom. Now, I decided to go with Rotom instead of Chandelure, just because I've used Chandelure so much recently. However, with hindsight, I'm not exactly sure if this was the wisest choice, but it did give me an opportunity to name this thing Candy Corn. Much like everything else this run, it does have a terrible nature, though. And very close by on Route 16, I find a Pumpkaboo instead of Phantom. It ends up having an adamant nature, which I guess is the first good nature of this entire run. And because of the universal Pokemon randomizer, at level 37, Pumpkaboo evolves into Gorgeist. And I honestly can't think of a more fitting Pokemon to add to the team. Now, I don't know what it is about X and Y specifically, but the trainer battles are super tough, and I almost go down to a crit payback from this sock, but luckily, we live through it. And okay, so far the game's been pretty manageable, but this is the point, this is the exact turning point where things really start getting ugly. This is the point where I realize that Team Flare's admins have a ton of Dark-type Pokemon. And I'm very lucky I found any kind of strategy whatsoever for this Houndoom, because it hits me with a foul play that gets me down into the red, and I heal up a bit with a Citrus Berry, which actually acts activates my Unburden ability. This means I can outspeed and fly into the air as Poison takes it down to a range where Fly takes it out the next turn. All right, we got through that one safely, but Serena is back and she's back with a vengeance. Now, I went into this battle thinking it would be really easy. We beat Serena so many times in the past in this game that we should just be able to set up with Swords Dance and take her out. Easy peasy, right? And for the start of the battle, that's exactly what happened. I take out the Meow Stick with a Shadow Sneak, then we got Flareon. It too gets knocked out with a Shadow Sneak. But next up is Greninja and this thing can out-prioritize me with a Water Shuriken, so I have to swap out into Witch, who can tank a Dark Pulse, and that gets us down to a range where Citrus Berry activates, which activates the Unburden ability, so now we actually outspeed the Greninja. The first turn it goes for a Water Shuriken, which is fine, but we can then outspeed and go for a Thunderbolt the next turn to take it out. Now that's one problem dealt with, but the biggest problem is really this Absol, her final Pokemon, and I've got nothing I can switch into a Night Slash that could potentially crit us out of existence. So I had to make an incredibly heavy choice choice here, something that'll burden me for the rest of my life, but I decided that the least useful member right now is gonna be Witch, so sorry Witch, you'll have to take one for the team. You'll always be remembered as a hero by me and the viewers, Witch, but for now, Boo's gonna have to step in and absolutely bedazzle this thing. Not exactly as clean a victory as I would have hoped for, but like I said, it's all downhill from here. Yo, what exactly is this thing? I don't get it. Vroom, 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 
Boom. All right, next in line of the Kalos gym leaders that nobody can seem to remember is Olympia and her psychic types. And listen, Ghost is super effective against psychic, so it probably won't come as a surprise to you when I say that this went pretty smoothly. Really, the most unexpected hiccup in my plan is the fact that Slowking is a really bulky boy. He a thick one. And a thick one that can hit like a truck at that. Jack-o'-lantern barely tanks a psychic as we then pivot out into Trick or Treat to go for a toxic. Not wanting to be put to sleep by Yawn, I decide to swap out and I never understand why the AI does this, but it goes for Yawn again. So I swap back into Trick or Treat, but this time it goes for Calm Mind, which could actually get kinda scary. The following turn, I go for Protect just to rack up a bit more toxic damage, but then I decide to swap out if it goes for more Calm Minds because I really can't do anything with Trick or Treat. And very unfortunately, after it sets up another one, Toxic takes it down into Hyper Potion range, so I decide to go for a free Swords Dance here, and the combination of that and the massive toxic damage that Slow King is taking at this point puts it in a range where I can take it out with a single Shadow Sneak. Finally, we gotta do the same thing that we do to Serena's Meow stick and yeah just slap it with a shadow sneak and that's it for the seventh gym now as soon as we exit the gym we get a call from lysander on the holocaster unproductive fools are consuming our future Okay, now listen here, Lysander. As a YouTuber, I take personal offense to that. This guy's going down. Okay, now in the interest of time, I'm only gonna show the final Lysander battle because we fight this guy three times and I didn't lose any Pokemon the first two. And on the way to that fight, we have a surprisingly easy time beating all the admins with a bunch of dark types. Your ability flies in the face of all probability. Just what is the source of your power? Yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe my hair? Do you want to know unending pain like I have? Buddy, we're all waiting for the Battle Frontier to come back. You're not the only one in unending pain. Ultra Mega Huge Crystal Flower thing of Doom go brrrr. Now I gotta be real, Xerneas does get major points for having antlers, but the Christmas lights, they're a little bit too early, buddy. Points detracted. Okay, it's finally time to once again take on Discount Ginger Thanos. Now for this fight, I was gonna go with a super interesting strategy, but it would have been so risky, and I came up with this one strategy that's uh, pretty boring, but it's super reliable. You see, the only attacking move that this Mien Xiao can actually hurt me with is acrobatics, and I resist that, so I can freely set up to plus six attack with Sword Dance, and then plus six speed with Autotomize. This means that Mian Xiao gets one shot by a Shadow Sneak, and both Pyroar and Honchkrow go down to a Sacred Sword. And very unfortunately for Lysander, Gyarados turns into a Dark type when it Mega Evolves, so that's a super effective hit, and your plans are foiled. You'll think twice about calling me unproductive, Lysander. Now that we've saved the world from a planet-destroying maniac, it's time to get back to our quest, and the first thing we have to do is take on our friends, and they really don't stand a chance. I mean, who thought these guys would win? We then get access to the Pokemon Village, where we can find our next encounter in a garbage can, a Banat. I name it Mummy and go to Terminus Cave, where I find myself a Dusk Stone, where we can use to finally evolve Skeleton into an Aegislash. And if you haven't seen this thing in action, then you're in for a treat. Because you see, the next challenge we have to face is the Ice-type Gym Leader, Wolfric, and the final challenge in our Gym Gauntlet. Wolfric starts out with a Bomb of Snow, so I go into Skeleton, and here I can pretty much freely set up three Swords Dances and three Atomizers once again and tear through through this man's team. And this means we didn't actually lose a single Pokemon to any of the gym leaders. I really hope we don't have to fight Serena anytime soon, but moving on, we get to Victory Road. Wait a minute, Serena, you're here too? I mean, under that beautiful night sky, I'd say that that's a good thing, but we actually have to take her on in one final battle. As per usual, she starts out with Meow Stick, so I take it out with one Shadow Ball right off the bat. Next up is Greninja, and this thing can take me out in one hit, so I swap out into Trick or Treat to tank a Dark Pulse. I say tank, but it leaves me in the red, so I I have to swap out into Skeleton, who actually managed to tank it fairly well. The following turn, I go for a King's Shield just to get more leftovers so that I can guarantee to live a non-crit Dark Pulse the next turn and take out this thing with a Sacred Sword. That's two Pokemon down. Now next up is Flareon, and since I'm so low, I can't risk Skeleton here, so I swap out into Zombie. I have to risk a Lava Plume burn, but luckily I don't get burned and I can take it out with an Earthquake. Next up is Absol, and unfortunately this leaves me in the exact same position as the last battle, but this time it goes for Swords Dance, so at least I guess I can get a Fake Out in, but that's gonna be it for Trick or Treat. Then once again, just as before, I send in Boo and clean things up with a Dazzling Gleam. Finally, Serena's added an Altaria to her team, but considering that it only has has Dragon Pulse and Moonblast to attack me with, I take the risk here and it can't even take me out with a crit, so two Dazzling Gleams does the job. Oh Serena, you're taking it all from me. 
At this point, we have a few more preparations before the final challenge, so I pick up the TM for Sludge Bomb, and we have to fight a few more trainers in Victory Road. Fortunately, though, Zombie can handle these trainers really well. These three trainers at the end of Victory Road are probably even harder than all the gym leaders combined. But because of our tight matchups in this run, it ended up being pretty easy. And so the time has come. The time to see if we're fit to be the champion. Let's take on the Pokemon League. And as logic would dictate, I decided to challenge the Elite Four members easiest to hardest. So let's start out with Seabold using his water types. And despite me saying this was easy, I went with a really risky strategy of starting out with Hypnosis, which has some pretty bad accuracy. But the thing is, I can't take this thing out with one Thunderbolt. And so in putting it to sleep, I can take it out without taking any damage whatsoever. Gyarados is next, obviously goes down to a four times effective Thunderbolt, and Starmie falls to a Shadow Ball. I then decide to put Barbarical to sleep just so that I can get a safe switch in out to Jack-O-Lantern. Barbarical then wakes up and misses me with a Stone Edge, and I can take it out with a quad effective Seed Bomb. And so with our first Elite Four battle behind us, it's time to take on the next one, Malva and her Fire Types. And fortunately for us, I've got the perfect answer for our entire team in Zombie. Knowing that I can survive a Flamethrower, I decide to go for a Rock Polish just so that I can outspeed that Talon Flame in the back. I then give Zombie free range to go on a Tectonic Rampage, taking out every single one of Malva's Pokemon in one hit. I don't know about you guys, but I've really come to enjoy using Golurk in this run. And now with half the Elite Four defeated, it's time to take on one of our more difficult battles against Wickstrom and his Steel types. And this battle went a little bit unexpectedly, but to start off, he goes for Klefki, and I decide to go for Zombie, and he sets up Spikes with Priority Prankster, and I can take him out with Earthquake. Knowing I can take a crit Night Slash from Scizor, I decide to lower its speed with Rock Tomb, but Night Slash actually does some juicy damage, so I swap out into Jack-O-Lantern. It does end up getting a crit on Jacko, which leaves it in the red, so I have to swap out into Mummy. I expect it to go for priority bullet punch here, so the next turn I swap into Skeleton, who basically takes nothing. I then go for a King Shield, and since Scizor has only contact moves, it gets its attack halved. I go for a Sword Stance, and then another King Shield to lower Scizor's attack further and take it out with a Sacred Sword. Wickstrom's next Pokemon is the ridiculous looking Probo Pass, so I go for a King Shield just to scout what it's gonna do, and obviously it goes for an Earth Power, so I swap out into Candy. Corn. I then decide to go for a substitute to see if it can survive a power gem, but unfortunately it does enough, so I just go for a thunderbolt, and the power gem doesn't actually take me out, so I swap back out into skeleton. Expecting another earth power here, I swap out into Boo, who also has levitate despite standing on the ground, and I get hit by a flash cannon as I miss a hypnosis. I then actually hit my hypnosis, and look at Brobo pass! <laughs> Now that this weird steely mustache thing is asleep, I can take it out with a couple of Shadow Balls. This means Aegis Flash is the only Pokemon left we have to face, but our team isn't exactly looking that good, so I swap out into Candy Corn. This was meant to be a sack, but since it went for King Shield, I can set up a substitute and get it into its attack mode. And since Attack Stance Aegis Slash has both 50 speed and defenses, I can take it out, and somehow Candy Corn lives to see another day. But our Elite Four troubles have really only just begun, and we got through that last fight without any deaths through sheer luck. Now Drasna starts out the fight with a Dragalge, which we can easily just pick off with an Earthquake from Zombie. Next up is Altaria, and I decide to lower its speed with a Rock Tomb as it sets up a Cotton Guard to plus three defense. I go for another Rock Tomb, and she then goes for Sing but misses, and this is where I should have cut my losses. I get put to sleep by another Sing, and that's probably the single biggest mistake throughout this whole run. But I switch into Jack-O-Lantern just to set up a Leech Seed as she gets to plus six with Cotton Guard, and we then trade status. Jack-O-Lantern being put to sleep here is also very detrimental for the end of this fight, but I swap into Candy Corn, who can easily tank a Dragon Pulse and then get some health back from Leech Seed and set up a sub. And what I'm doing here is pretty predictable. I'm pretty much just stalling out Burn and Leech Seed damage, but unfortunately Drasna goes for a full restore. So with my substitute up, I decide to try to do as much damage as possible and up my attack with a Charge Beam. Now luckily Leech Seed is keeping us fairly healthy, so the next turn as I go for a Thunderbolt, I can survive a Dragon Pulse and Leech Seed is enough to take it out. Out. This means that Drasna's next Pokemon is Noivern, and this thing is a speed demon. It'll outspeed anything in our team, and I have to let Candy Corn go here. And so at this point, I'm getting pretty desperate, and I swap into Zombie, who's still asleep, but I know I can survive two Dragon Pulses, so I decide to see if I wake up, but unfortunately, I don't. 
So I decide to swap out into Skeleton, who can tank a Dragon Pulse very well, and I find out that a Flamethrower doesn't do that much damage in Shield Stance. I can then do over half with Iron Head, so as long as I go for a King Shield to get me back into Shield Stance, the next turn I can survive a Flamethrower, unfortunately get burned, and then take it out with Iron Head. Now through some stroke of luck, Burn actually leaves me at 1 HP as she sends in Drudagon. But we're not out of the woods yet, because this Drudagon has two normal moves, a Fighting move, and Dragon Tail, so it's gonna use Dragon Tail every single time because it's the only thing that can hit us and swap us around. Now, very fortunately, I have Gengar that can go for Hypnosis, and this would have been fine if the human factor wasn't an issue here. You see, throughout this whole run, I've taught my Pokemon the right moves, I've made the correct decision, but this time, it bit me in the behind that I didn't teach my Gengar Dazzling Gleam before the fight. So, of course, Skeleton gets phased in and destroyed by Burn. Fortunately, I can burn this Dredagon back, but we then have to just swap around insanely to try to get some damage on this thing. And if Zombie and Jacko wouldn't have been asleep, this would have been a lot easier to deal with, but eventually Gengar gets sent out and I can take it out with a Shadow Ball, but we did lose our best Pokemon. See, Agent Slash would have totally trivialized the champion fight, but unfortunately, now we have to go into this fight with only four Pokemon. So after a bit of re-strategizing, we have to go up against Diantha, who starts out with Halucha, and I go ahead and start with Zombie. The first turn, she sets up a Sword Stance as I go for a Rock Polish to boost my speed, and I go for an Iron Defense just so that she can't do too much damage to me. I then send an Onslaught of Rock Tombs to take out the Halucha as she sends in Aurorus, which gets absolutely destroyed by an Earthquake. You're doing well so far, Zombie. Next up is Gorgeist, so I go for a Rock Tomb to lower its speed as it vanishes with Phantom Force, so I have to swap out into something else, so I choose just jack-o'-lantern. Now I'm fairly confident I can take one Shadow Force because of my massive defense, and the next turn I can outspeed and go for a Will-O-Wisp. It then vanishes, so I know it's going to hit me with Phantom Force, which I can now live a lot better because of that burn, and I swap into Bannet. Now I should have expected a Phantom Force here, so I unfortunately go for Protect in Vain as it vanishes. I then swap out into Zombie, who can hopefully take this Phantom Force, and I survive on 41 HP and can take out this Gorgeist with an Earthquake combined with Burn. This means it's Diantha's three remaining Pokemon versus my four, and she sends in Gudra, which I take down to about half health with an Earthquake, and then go down to a Dragon Pulse. So I think it's time I reveal my secret weapon and Mega Evolve my Gengar! And with all that power, not even Gudra's massive special defense can stand up to a Dazzling Gleam. Diantha has two Pokemon left, the first one being Tyrantrum, which I can totally destroy with another Dazzling Gleam. This means it's Mega Evolution versus Mega Evolution, and we're both super effective against each other, so it comes down to who's faster. But since I've already Mega Evolved, I'm already at my Mega Speed tier and can go for a Sludge Bomb which doesn't take it out, but I do get the poison! So even though my Mega Gengar falls, so does Gardevoir to the poison we inflicted with Sludge Bomb. And so that's how I did it. That's how I beat a Pokemon X Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Spoopy types. And what did I learn? Well, it wasn't exactly new to me that both Aegislash and Gengar are pretty busted, but I'd say the game put up a pretty good fight since we only had Gorgeist and Bannet left in the end. There's nothing left in the box either. So ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like, and if you're not subscribed yet, what are you doing? Additionally, I'd advise you to go over to twitch.tv and give a follow to Antler Boy Live, where I stream almost every day at this point. I know, it's a surprise to me too. I used to never be live, but now I'm Antler Boy very live, and I'm streaming a shiny-only hardcore Nuzlocke in Pokemon Emerald together with Keegan J. So turn on those notifications for community posts in the future, and until we see each other next time, have a good one.